Good morning. Uh, welcome to our November 16, 2016 special meeting. Uh, are there any public comments this morning? Okay. Seeing none, we're going to adjourn into closed session. All right. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our November 15, 2016 special meeting. And I'd just like to report out on our uh, closed session. Um, Public employee pursuant to government code section 54957B1, interim county administrative officer board action. Um, none yet. Uh, we're going to uh, resume back into closed session after we meet uh, today. Um, so, with that, could you please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? My Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So uh, from, from there we have public comments. Um, any item of interest to the public that is within the subject matter jurisdiction? There we go. Um, of the board and is not posted on the consent of regular agendas may be addressed during the public comment period. California law prohibits the board from taking action on any matter which is not posted on the agenda unless it is determined to be an emergency by the board of supervisors. If public comment is completed before the 30 minute allotted time period, the board may immediately move to the regular agenda. If public comment is not completed during the allotted time period, it will be continued at the conclusion of the consent agenda in order to provide an opportunity for the remainder of comments to be heard. So this morning, um, we will have three minute comments for public comments. Any public comments? No? Okay. Good morning, Al Segala, Taxpayer Association. Um, is there any reason to, hey, to keep those doors locked out in front? Um, I, I thought that the meeting started at 9 o'clock this morning, so I had an opportunity to be out there for an hour and a half. And I noticed all kinds of people were trying the doors, and then, then they read the sign, they go to the side door. And the reason why we, we have it that way was because we had um, a security check because of the court, the court system, we don't have security check now, and perhaps it would be time to take the signs down and have the doors open during working hours. Does that make sense? Happy day. Good idea, Al. Another one. I think it's in regards to the ADA compliance. The doors are no, they're the ADA entrance is over here. The ADA is these. This door is inaccessible. Yeah, person, I'd like to have the choice. <laughs> All right. So let's move on to our regular agenda. We're going to uh, switch the agenda around a little bit. Uh, sheriff first, and then sheriff second, and then some public works. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So item two is from the sheriff's office to adopt a resolution approving the revisions and updates to the 2016 Calaveras County Operational Area Emergency Operations Plan. Good morning. Wade Whitney from the sheriff's office. So the two, six, uh, 2016 update is just that. It's an update of the 2011 plan that was previously approved by the board. Um, the 2016 update includes, we, we sent out a draft copy to department heads, um, had Dana from Cal OES review it. We had Cal Fire review it. Um, this update reflects the suggestions from the department heads and, and the other departments that were involved. Do you guys have any questions about it? 
Can you highlight any of the specifics? Um, I can say that the, are you talking about all the individual parts yeah. of the plan? Okay. Any major highlights? So part one of the plan talks about uh, just general information. It mostly points out what the types of hazards are for the county, mm -hmm. such as uh, wildland fire, floods, extreme weather, um, pandemic flu, airplane crashes. It also talks about Cal Fire uh, aircraft crashes and just general information about those, what the expected damage might be from, from those types of incidents. Um, then part two goes into uh, the response phase, so the initial response, and it outlines what each of the individual departments within the county that might have a role within the response phase, what their uh, roles and responsibilities would be for each, each of those hazards. And it's, it's divided by hazard-specific information. And then moving into part three is the extended response operations. Uh, this mostly talks about the roles and responsibilities of everybody that's in the emergency operations center during a response. And then finally, part four is the recovery operations. And it talks about uh, roles and responsibilities for the different agencies within the county during recovery. So was there any discussion about the organization chart to this plan? Or is this just continued the, from uh, 2011? It is a continuation. The one uh, highlighted change that I can point out to you on the management section under part three, um, probably the most significant change. It used to refer to MAC, which is the multi-agency or multi-agency coordination committee. Um, I changed it based on reviewing some uh, emergency operations plans from other counties and in discussions with Chief White and uh, some other people that are more familiar with these types of plans. I changed it to uh, what I refer to as a management advisory group and basically that group is all of the department heads that have a role within this plan. The MAC still exists and the MAC will take place. Uh, but the management advisory group becomes a core group that would meet during uh, the EOC operations every day as well. Sergeant Ray, do you a uh, sergeant now? Yes. Could you uh, provide a reference page for that organizational chart? Uh, 199 is what I'm referring to as the management advisory group. I guess when I look at this, it's like what what I don't see on here, and I'm looking at packet page 29 and page 9. I don't see where the the board of supervisors is plays a role in this at all. The board of supervisors would be advised of the information through the CAO's office, and then there also could be part of the MAC as well. So you're, you're basically taking uh, uh, 2.17 and tossing it? I'm sorry, say it again. 2.17, which is the county code, right? 2.17. I'm not familiar with the Right. Are you referring to the 1975 uh, county? Okay. No, this doesn't. This is not replacing that. That still is in effect, uh, but that is also needs to be updated because it is a 40 some odd year old document. This is a more modern um, plan. If you take a look at that 75, uh, the titles of a lot of the things that are in here uh, don't even exist anymore. That's why that that document does need to be rewritten and modernized to today's standards. Sims and NIMS didn't even exist during that time. Okay. 
And uh, how many of these positions uh, are currently filled at this point? You mean the positions inside the EOC? Yeah. Uh, are all, all those pretty much all filled? No. <laughs> no, those would be filled by people that we bring in depending on each of the okay. depending on each of the incidents. Okay. I will also say that this is in compliance with SIMS and NIMS, as uh, Lieutenant Harberty mentioned. I, uh, is in, in line with the state emergency operations plan guidelines. Is this a requirement to approve it every five years? I don't recall if there's a requirement. Our plan specifically talks about having it updated every three years. Well, Sergeant, as I see your, your flow chart here, I see no reference to the Board of Supervisors being advised by any, any entity. Uh, is that an oversight or is that? No, that, again, it would be the CAO's office when they. It doesn't say that. It lists the county administration and the various departments there, but it, so it makes no reference to the, the advising of the Board of Supervisors of any issue. Now, I'm, I might not be able to. Uh, take the time right now to go into the, the documentation of it but I just by the flow chart no it's it's not listed that way in the flow chart that is correct or the documentation. is it listed in the documentation somewhere no not not specifically so written. basically they don't have to advise the board of supervisors right uh that's my understanding they work for you right doesn't say that don't see it here okay Supervisor Alvaro? Yes, sir. Um, it would not be an oversight. We would absolutely, the county would be advising the board um, of any operations or actions as um, the board has operational control over the budget and has the, depending on the uh, size and severity of the emergencies that we're dealing with, um, the board would be definitely uh, brought into that and advised. Uh, it's not necessarily addressed right in here, but it's it, it, every every step that uh, is taken throughout the government and how we handle it. This would be a 900-page document if we noted every single step. This is not in the left to be intentionally left the the board out. You're definitely in the vault. You're involved and get uh, get the briefings. If it's a small matter that to have is handled within a few hours. You may or may not want to know about it immediately. You may want to know about it a little bit later. If it, oh, but if, when it morphs into something that's longer, you're definitely going to be getting contacted by Sheriff's Administration or the CAO's office. Lieutenant, I understand that. that that's the reality of it. Mm -hmm. Bottom line is you're going to renew this every three years. Yes. We're going to have different people sitting in these chairs. Yes. And, and this we don't is have a, any written documentation of, of how we're going to do this, and we have no guideline and that, that that's what my point is uh, what are we going to do in the future how do we make this information in a handbook if you will so we can make sure we cover all these bases well it would be as simple as putting a, in, an insert into the flow chart saying that the board of supervisors will be notified um, during the, these events we do it anyway, but if you if you prefer to have it Sounds in the like writing, a great idea to that's make. fine. Uh, the nice thing about having the board generally, you know, because of your attrition, everybody this this does uh, this sits on everybody's desk, every department head desk. Uh, we encourage the department heads and the board of supervisors to go through this and the uh, emergency uh, and the uh, hazard mitigation plan regularly because uh, there's a lot of information here, and even for us who have gone to the trainings and everything, you have to go back and re-reference this stuff, and every time we have an incident we're cracking this open and going to okay which which situation do we have and what's our checklist and one of the first things is someone's going to be calling talking to the board uh the chair uh the cao the sheriff the captain lieutenant somebody uh, but if you feel more comfortable having a insert of just saying that in there this is a fluid document it can be changed 
uh, even though this is updated every three years, it's not locked in every three years. We can change this. You could ratify, you could uh, okay this today, and in, in a week from now, if something comes up, we can modify it. I, I would feel more comfortable if there was a reference made, wherever it fits into your flow chart. Very good. Uh, and I understand reality, and, and we've been through this before, and being, I, I understand your position, and I agree with it. It's just, I may not be here. Well, it is, and it's, it's all about education, because that's part right. of our job as well, is to keep the, the department heads and the board educated as to what we do, and what we do as a, man as a management uh, uh, of the emergencies. And uh, again, as long as both people have this on their desk and they go through it, it's, it's, it, it makes it pretty clear what everybody's job and responsibilities are. And uh, again, keeping the board in the loop is absolutely necessary. It's critical. It's, it's, absolutely. it's not even a second thought in our minds. No. Thank you, Is this a document that can be revised? Um, you know, later today we're discussing about where OES um, looks like in the future. So can this be revised as needed and not waiting for the three-year time frame or one year or whatever? Yes. Okay. You know, part of what I see is, is more or less what Supervisor Oliveira said in regards to identification of the, bo the Board of Supervisors under the Management Advisory Group. Um, but I also, you know, see agencies on there that I... You know, the water agencies come to my mind. Right. Um, you know, it, I think it's hard to cover all the different kinds of emergencies. you got to have a core. Um, but I take something like the Butte Fire and the water agencies were a key <coughs> component to, to that. And I don't see where they would be serving in an advisory capacity on the management group. Um, you know, I, so I, I don't know how that all fits into it. I didn't see that in the document. Is it just because somebody knows like, oh, yeah, we want to go call them? Or how, how does that play out in, in this arena? So the vision of the management advisory group was to allow the opportunity for all the, the department heads to meet separately with um, or during an EOC activation. So the, the idea would be that the management advisory groups meet, let's say they meet at 7 o'clock in the morning for, for a briefing to discuss any policy information that we need to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, then we could call a MAC meeting after that. And the MAC meeting would include those uh, other agencies that you're referring to. Yeah. So there's like a utility? To, if you go down to like, a, what is it, page uh, 178, um, it has the EOC director checklist there. And it goes on, established communications is required. Full mobilization of all communications could include law enforcement, fire, public works, health and medical, amateur radio operators, schools, Red Cross, utility companies. So they're, I mean, they... But I'm talking about including them. Yeah, they, that, well, I mean, that's, yeah. It's one thing to say, communicate out, but it's like including them in that process. Well, in, in, in that management advisory group, we would decide which agencies do we need to bring in for the MAC. And that's when we would call, make those calls and have them respond to the EOC. Okay. Or, I'm sorry, not the EOC, to the to wherever we're going to have the meeting. Because there, there might be incidents that you're not going to need the water. Machine. Right. And I'm thinking more utilities. Or utilities. I, I mean, mean, it's a broad base. Yeah. And there are uh, charts in here that show all of those agencies, pages 74 through. Right. Yeah, I see agencies listed. I just yeah. don't see where they're inclusive on the committee or the advisory group. Yeah. And again, the, the idea behind the advisory group was for it to be a core group of county representatives that have a role in whatever the disaster is. The MAC group would expand from there. Okay. Yeah, and then you guys would meet and just discuss what, who needs to be uh, engaged is, you know, according to what you were dealing with. Yes. Without the board, right? No, not necessarily without the board. Like I said, the board would become a part of the MAC group if you guys wanted to join those meetings. But in a normal circumstance, if it was a major emergency like the Butte Fire, the chair of the board at least, and 
uh, would be included in those discussions with the CAO, I would imagine. I mean, that's just a given. Is that why it's such a given that you don't even need to put it in there? Is that is that what I'm hearing? Yes. And I will point out also, Supervisor Olvera, that on page 52, it does talk about notifying the Board of Supervisors. It's not specific that um, dispatch calls the CAO and then the CAO notifies the Board of Supervisors, but there is documentation that talks about that. That's on page 52, you say? Yes. You have to excuse me, our, our iPads don't That's okay. process faster than you than we have in our copies. Back onto the flow chart there. So um, you're going to add just board of supervisors in there, uh, according to what Supervisor Oliver was saying. Yes, I can add that in where they're being contacted by the CAO's office. Is that what I understand? No, uh, on the flow chart where it has the list of uh, the the management advisory yeah, group. Just add the board of supervisors in there or chair of the board. Um, is that what we're saying? We want to just put the chair instead of having the whole board there, so we don't violate the Brown Act. What do you guys want to do? That was one of the concerns. Was the brown? No. They're asking about uh, adding. Um, remember the management yeah, advisory group. Right? They want to yeah. add the board the chair, chair to the board. management advisory group. So it's my or me. Rather than having the CAO. Yeah, the chair does it. He'll get demonized. So it's better to try to just do the whole board. <laughs> Can you repeat the request, please, so I understand it clearly? Let's go back to the flow chart again. That was, was it 158. Was that? 195, I believe. Thank you. Is that packet page 195? Or? <laughs> Forgot. Like packet 29. What? I guess it would help if we are looking at the right thing. Yeah. What, 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 what actually, page is the flow it's chart? It's actually on? in here twice. I can't find either one. The flow chart I'm referring to is page nine or packet page twenty nine. Oh. That's no, but it would, that was the organizational chart. I yeah. believe it was for the EOC and the uh, director. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's it. Page nine. I get one ninety five. Maybe good. there's another one. Yeah, I mean, I think just adding the, the chair of the board there, uh, you know, with the county administrator would be fine for me. As far as notifications yeah. go? Mm -hmm. Right. This is part of the advisory group. That's what we need as long as it's advisory. Okay. So as I understand it, should we have an event occur where the MAC is activated, notifications would be made by the CAO's office to the Board of Supervisors? Is that how this program is designed to work? Well, what you guys just discussed and was adding, you said the board, to the management advisory group. Management so, advisory group. Yes. So I will add that information to this flow chart. Okay. And then I'll, uh, it'll take a little bit to update because I have to change all the other pages that go and with And who that. would be responsible for making that notification? Would it be under the EOC? Well, that goes back to page 52. Back so, so if there's an incident that requires Board of Supervisors notification, the Director of Emergency Services would be notified. Th then the Director would either make the notification to the CAO's office and the Board of Supervisors, or he, can, he or she can select to have our dispatch center <coughs> notify the Board of Supervisors. Okay. I would be comfortable with that. The admin office or the dispatch center? Uh, depending on the severity of the event. But it, I think that that's fluid. It just depends on where the person is at the time, and uh, yeah. oftentimes the dispatchers are the you ones that are able to make the notifications. Uh, how are you going to get a hold of CAO? 
Mm -hmm. Dispatch center would have to make that notification through the direction of the EOC director. Correct. Okay. And that may even occur before the EOC is ever Oh, sure. Sure. And I know as, as a board, we'd want to be advised of something like that, of a, of a magnitude of that type of an event. And I'm sure our, our realistic and our normal communications would take care of that to a certain extent. But once again, we're developing a plan. We have right. to develop this plan for someone that can look at it and see it and, and read it and interpret it. Yes. On the first day of the event would be nice. Yes. Mm -hmm. To the 17th. Okay. Public comment. Public comment. Thank you. You're welcome. Marty Crane, um, District 5. I just wanted to say that I've um, been involved with emergency preparedness for many, many years, and the SIMS uh, process and NIMS process is a well documented, well um, researched and process that is accepted um, nationwide. I don't know about worldwide, but nationwide. And is used through Red Cross worldwide. So what I wanted to say was the first thing you learn when you get involved with this is to stay in your own lane. In other words, stepping out of your lane into something that someone else is in charge of creates chaos, creates um, negative um, impacts for those experts who are in charge of doing what they're supposed to do and making the um, keeping the emergency from becoming a disaster so my concern is yes the board should be notified um, but what do you do with that information afterwards are you experts on on uh, emergency preparedness do you know what is um, I think maybe our board, if you're going to be notified, uh, you need to be productive and helpful in that scenario. So I think um, if you're going to be notified in this, I think you need to have some training. You, whoever else sits in, this, in these seats down the road, need to have some training so that you don't undermine the efforts of the, those who are um, actually uh, in charge of doing the work. So. That's all for now. Thank you. Um, Al Sagala, Taxpayer Association. Um, there's some pretty good points made here. Um, the most important thing is who's responsible for what. Okay, if, uh, if the Sheriff's Department is going to be re responsible for this activity, it follows that they need to coordinate and communicate with all the entities involved, including the Board of Supervisors. But in that process, uh, cannot be a disturbance of that responsibility. In other words, you can't have the Board of Supervisors and the Sheriff responsible for decisions. So it has to remain with the, with the Sheriff. It's a separate entity. Um, the emphasis, I think, is in the process of communicating with all the other people that are involved, I think that uh, that's, that's a no-brainer. And if that's what you're asking, is to assure that the communi communication takes place, um, I think that's a good idea, and that'll work real well. But if, the, if it's being implied that the Board of Supervisors will extend control over this activity, then we run into a problem on, on how that's to be. And it could end up where you have uh, unintended negative consequences where you have delays because of the decision-making process, processes convoluted. So um, if we stick with the idea that the, uh, this process is under the sheriff, he's held accountable, he's a public official, he's elected, and, uh, or will be, um, then I think it works best. Thank you. Okay, 
Any other comments? Uh, good morning. My name is Bill Winhold. I live here in District 1. Um, I'm encouraged by some of the comments that I've heard this morning that uh, the board and others have taken the time to review the, the document that's before you here. Uh, I worked for the county for over a decade in emergency management, and I still work in emergency management in another organization. Um, uh, I've heard comment already about the, the plan being compliant with current NIMS and SIMS regulations. Um, I can tell you that my organization, too, has to have detailed plans to be compliant with regulations, uh, but frequently those don't go far enough. And so uh, there's been comment this morning about how detailed and lengthy your emergency operations plan should be. The fact is that it should be as lengthy as you have time to write. Um, what you are looking at endorsing today is simply a guide um, and without having specifics to it, there's no details on how to make that guide operational. Uh, that was one of the major issues, I believe, in the Butte fire. Uh, the county had an emergency operations plan, but there was not a plan on how to make that functional. That's a critical element. Just having the document is just another binder on the shelf. It's another check on the box. It's a permission slip from the feds and the states that you are compliant with the regulations to be a participant in emergency management programs. But that doesn't mean that you're any better prepared or ready for the next crisis that comes to the community. So uh, you're taking a, a positive step this morning by updating and reviewing that document, but that's only one step in the process of emergency management. And I wish to encourage you to, to hold all the other officials to complete the process by making that plan operational and practiced and not just uh, something else that's on the book shelf, shelf that uh, met the regulations. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Any other comments? <coughs> Board comments? I'm sure I have comment. Yeah. <sighs> We all learn from experience. I think we can almost all agree that one of the problems we faced with the Butte fire was communication. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Segala, you were absolutely correct in your public comments. We need to have, number one, the information available from our responsible entities, like our sheriff's department, like our fire departments, like our social services. That information has to be accurate, has to be correct, because we are the avenue, the catalyst to the public. And I'm talking about Board of Supervisors. We have to make sure that we are properly informed with the right information at the proper time. Because they're not calling the Sheriff's Department, they're not calling the Fire Department, they're not calling Human Services, they're calling us. And I am not going to put myself in a position to provide inaccurate information when it comes to saving lives or risking lives for the safety of this county. That's why I think the Board of Supervisors should be appraised, advised with the correct information at the proper time. And that's up to the entities that are doing that job. Sheriff's Department, Fire Department, Social Services, and et cetera. And that, that's my position on, on why we ought to be a part of this in that limited role. We can't interfere with what you folks do best. You are first responders. You're the experts. But then again, our job doesn't stop when the fire pits out. Our job lasts, as you well know, two to five, six years down the road on recovery. And we've got to be right in what we do. And I mean jointly right, everybody. And I don't think we've had that luxury on this event. And I want to prevent that in the future. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay. Um, my only comment is that um, Certainly find out who you're working with when you go through something like this. And uh, I, think, I thought the Sheriff's Department did a fantastic job on um, 
uh, response. I don't think that um, I couldn't see anybody doing anything better than what they did. So, um, other than that, it's going to move forward with uh, the way it is. And then we'll see the next time how it works. Yeah, I'm fine. I think the overall program is a good start, but I have to agree with Bill is that, you know, I think there needs to be more um, detail into it overall so that's clearly communicated. You know, I look at places like evacuation centers and, and um, you know, Butte Fire was a prime example of the regionalization of support that we needed and received from, you know, hospitals and and uh, staging areas and, and locations for people to stay and so on and so forth. So, you know, I hope that this is a good start and it doesn't go on a shelf because we get grant money and, you know, we committed that part of it, um, that we continue to uh, drill down on this a bit and be more specific in uh, the overall plan. And uh, certainly there's a lot of other agencies that I can see being involved as well as we narrow down on this but um, it is a it is a good start okay now motion you have a motion to approve I'll move to approve second okay we got a motion by supervisor Olivera second by supervisor Wright all in favor aye aye, aye. aye. opposed all right Next agenda item. We're going to skip to item four. Request, uh, it's from the Sheriff's Department, to request the Board of Supervisors to review the Office of Emergency Services Strategic Staff Planning Overview and Presentation. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Chair. Um, hopefully, <coughs> with this uh, presentation, we can relieve some of your concerns about what you all just talked about with uh, OES and the process that we're going to be looking at. Here's, uh, we have a, um, we have a. Uh, no, we already have, those are for the public. Oh, you guys, that's for the public. Those are for the public. public. Okay, I thought those were for them too. Um, we have a uh, slideshow presentation we're gonna put on for you. Uh, there'll be multiple. Uh, folks coming up to talk about certain areas. Um, once Miss Munson gets it up and running. Again, this is just a, a presentation on um, how to bring OES back in, which we've talked about in the past. Um, there's a lot more uh, detail that we can go into, um, either now if you need to. Um, at the end, we'll have some questions and answers if you guys want. Um, or as we go, prefer to rather run through the program to show you where we're at. And if you have any questions, you know, we'll go from there. Um, I have Captain Macedo go ahead and start it. Good afternoon, Jim Macedo from the Sheriff's Office. Um, a little bit of a historical perspective from uh, uh, Calaveras County OES uh, history. Uh, the Office of Emergency Services uh, was operating uh, under the CAO's office from the uh, mid-1990s through 2003. In 2003, uh, the Sheriff's Office brought um, Clay Hawkins over as a Sheriff's Captain uh, to serve as the OES Manager and with him uh, the OES Division. Uh, was born. Uh, the OES division at one point in time was comprised of basically seven uh, part and full-time uh, staff members and it's going to be a little bit difficult but we're going to do our best to explain uh, how uh, over time some of those people worked full-time and part-time in the OES division and what they were able to uh, accomplish during that time. It is important though uh, to note that once the economy started to worsen uh, and uh, layoffs and resignations and reassignments occurred. 
So there was kind of a constant state and flow of people moving in and out of that division. Uh, again, we'll try and uh, explain that. Uh, some of those positions were absorbed uh, through layoffs. And then ultimately in 2014, um, we ended up having to transfer another uh, OES position to patrol. And um, as we speak today, we have the one part-time uh, sergeant and one uh, sheriff services technician, and then the special operations lieutenant, uh, Hubbardy, who oversees OES. Uh, he also <laughs> has uh, some oversight and uh, middle management of other divisions. So uh, with that, um, I'll bring up Lieutenant Dennis Hubbardy, and he's going to take the next couple of slides. The slide for you right there um, is the comparison of what OES was when it was at full capacity from 2000 to 2010 prior to the economy uh, taking a downturn. Um, on the right, it shows you what the current staffing is, which was part of the historical on the, pre on the previous slide. And you can see pretty much, um, even though some of uh, the, the sergeant and the deputy position is noted as emergency only, uh, those folks were out at the uh, uh, airport uh, working under the same roof uh, as OES. So they were a resource um, at any given time, depending on what the situation was. At that time, um, OES was functioning with the uh, HAZMAT and uh, EOD bomb teams. And that um, explains the two uh, HAZMAT specialist technicians uh, down below which with it currently it does not exist uh, under our current OES. Uh, and on the right is what the, we're operating on today. Next slide, please. Now, this is for just to show if there were no layoffs and the uh, OES staff stayed in place, we didn't have uh, uh, anybody retiring, and if the economy didn't change, and if, if OES was to be maintained um, as it was back then to today's standards, that would be the, what the flow chart would look like um, for OES and the relative salaries. Um, and on the right shows basically what that uh, would cost to run that division by today's dollars if OES did not shrink down in, uh, those, in the past six years. We're going to go through some uh, slideshows. Um, these are some of the counties we uh, went down and visited, Shasta County, Santa Barbara County, Ventura County. Um, uh, Shasta County is run by the Sheriff's Office, um, or excuse me, yeah, go ahead to the next slide. Um, this is run um, by the Sheriff's Office. This is their mobile command uh, center. Uh, they do not have an EOC like we do. so. This is what they use. They take it out to their sites. Um, this is the inside. This is their, the back portion of it where they do their briefings with their command staff. Um, this is just another view. Uh, they've got a, a printer there on the right-hand side. Um, their communication center, they had it set up for two dispatchers. Again, specifically set up for being on site. This is uh, Cal OES. They are a uh, region three uh, hub for uh, Cal OES, so they have this unit available to them. It's a portable satellite system. Um, what you can't see on the other side of this is a huge generator that this truck pulls so that they have um, accessibility to uh, electrical and, I believe, phone system also. Go ahead, Sheriff. Um, this is uh, uh, Santa Barbara. Um, This is run by uh, the county. Um, this is uh, all run underneath their CAO's office. Um, this is portion of their uh, command center. Um, multiple stations. Go ahead, share with the next slide. Um, they have 42 stations in total. Obviously, a pretty good sized county. Um, but these stations are, are manned all during an emergency, again, depending on the type of the emergency. Um, we chose them and Ventura County because they have a lot of the same type of disasters with the fires, flooding, and whatnot. Is why we use them as comparison. <coughs> Next slide. Again, uh, their mappings on the wall, um, all their stations uh, for all their different facilities. And it's kind of hard to see, but if you look up on the ceiling, that back left corner, you'll see a red. 
I think that was their finance. The one to the right is in blue. I think that was their logistics. So they had different areas set up for different portions of uh, what's going on within the EOC. Next slide. Um, this is their uh, organizational chart. Uh, Wade Whitney's going to come up and chat a little bit about that. So this is uh, basically the ICS structure inside uh, the, their EOC. It's very similar to what you saw in our emergency operations plan. Um, and those are all positions that could be filled during an incident. And all of the different units. Good, sir. Uh, this next slide is uh, Ventura County. Um, again, they have multiple stations uh, inside of their EOC. It's a designated uh, area for their EOC, uh, much like what we have. Um, actually, quite a bit larger, though. Next slide. Um, again, multiple, multiple stations uh, for a lot of people. Um, Ventura County, uh, by size, isn't a whole lot different from ours. Um, they have a lot more uh, population, but their population is more centralized. They have a lot more buckbrush areas. Next slide. Uh, this is our, uh, one of their command vehicles. Um, it's a uh, Chevy Tahoe. And you can't really see in this picture, but in the back of the vehicle, you can see the slide out. Um, they have a, a, a whiteboard. They have uh, different units. They have a printer there on the right. Um, they have a TV. Um, you didn't notice it on the top of there. But they have a satellite dish so that they can get uh, TV stations. And the reason they did that is they found that the news flying over and they get their information so fast because of social media and whatnot that people were coming up to them and saying, hey, did you know this was going on? And they didn't know. So they put TV um, on board so that they could monitor that stuff and see what was going on. Um, so next slide. Oh, OK. Go back one. Again, this is just another picture of the inside of it. There's multiple things going on within this uh, vehicle. Um, this is something that they would take out to uh, a site so that they could monitor it from the site. However, they do have their EOCs uh, inside of the uh, office there. Next slide. Captain Macedo. Oh. Sure, you could stay on this same slide. Uh, I want to just reiterate the, the reasons we went and contacted Shasta, Ventura, and Santa Barbara is all, all three of those uh, offices of emergency services are recognized as being well, well run, well put together, and experienced, experienced specifically with fires, floods, um, landslides. Uh, Ventura had a landslide that they went over uh, with us and how they dealt with that. And for those of you that were here in 1997, we had a landslide and we're not immune to having those types of threats. Ventura had also dealt with a, uh, an airline crash. Um, and we, uh, as many of you probably have seen, we have commercial airliners that fly over this county. So we wanted to discuss uh, agencies that have handled similar hazards, and we specifically chose those because they're not all run by uh, the sheriff's office. We know uh, that was one of the questions as to whether or not have a CAO model run, which Santa Barbara uh, does, and we talked to them uh, in, in specifically about uh, benefits of that versus uh, issues. Um, the same with uh, Ventura, and we'll, we'll tap into that later uh, if you have specific questions. This next slide, though, I'd like you to pay particular attention to because it is Ventura. Go back, Sherry, I'm sorry. Oh, it is Ventura's uh, organizational chart. There seems to be a lot of questions about notification, and we're going to talk about communications and notifications quite a bit uh, here in the next half hour or so. Um, but the organizational chart shows where the uh, there's actually a sheriff in between, or an under sheriff in between that captain and the sheriff. But they have a, a civilian OES manager. That's who we spent most of the time talking with. We talked to him extensively about his background and his training, his leadership, his capabilities, his role uh, within the county, and his role within the community. Uh, he has an, a, an administrative aide uh, that handles, obviously, fleet and office management and special projects. And then you'll see that there are two senior program administrators. They're kind of deputies uh, to that civilian OES manager. A lot of them handle the planning and preparedness sections, working with uh, fire, uh, animal services, um, and the rest of the county uh, emergency and department heads, both non-emergency and emergency department heads. You have uh, some program administrators uh, to, that actually respond and they uh, manage the emergency operations center. 
Um, you have some staff services manager, and you notice that is as needed. Um, they move those folks in and out of, uh, in and out of the, uh, uh, the Office of Emergency Services, uh, and they specifically handle training and exercises throughout the community. <clears throat> and then at the bottom you have some program administrators, and the one on the left-hand side you'll notice deals with uh, recovery and finance. We specifically asked both the uh, OES manager and the program administrators what their role was in working with uh, the county uh, uh, post event during recovery and they work with the respective department heads to manage uh, the recovery but I want to be crystal clear none of them actually go into the county departments and do the work for them they help facilitate through through the state Cali OES FEMA and any other entity that they that they need to work with they facilitate that they don't actually go work inside and we asked why is that uh, and specifically because you cannot expect a program administrator to become an expert in say public health and public works those are two incredibly different fields you cannot have a, hire a jack of all trades and expect them to take on the role of, as an expert for all of these other county departments. Everybody has a, an expertise in their field. And the reason I want to emphasize that so much is I don't want uh, the public or the board thinking that we're going to be, be, be able to comprise an Office of Emergency Services in this county that is going to be able to replace county employees or county department heads and be an expert in recovery with those, those departments. That model doesn't exist, at least that we can find in, in California through, through county OES systems. Next slide. A question, Kevin. Yes. I hate to interrupt you. Uh, of, of these positions we just discussed, are any of these sworn personnel positions to the sheriff's department? If you well, could roll back, roll back. They down. So we're going to show you some models later, okay. recommendations. But on this one, the civilian OES manager is non-sworn. I can tell you he was an excellent fit in their organization because he was prior military, so he understood chain of command, role within an organization. Um, and uh, but none of those people below the rank of captain. Uh, were sworn uh, for, for Ventura, uh, to, to clarify. Next slide. Uh, this is their uh, operations structure, and uh, you'll notice up, up top, if it's a major emergency that goes to the federal level, uh, that FEMA, uh, the joint, they have a joint field office where FEMA is stationed uh, there in Ventura County. Um, they work closely with uh, California uh, Office of Emergency Services and the State Operations Center. Uh, they too have a, uh, a MAC group. Uh, that MAC group uh, also works with uh, the Ventura County Operational Area and County Emergency Operations Center, which is again uh, run by the Sheriff's Office, but it's uh, often done under a joint command with fire or whoever the, uh, the hazard is. Uh, off to the side, one of their rooms in their uh, EOC, they have a JIC which is kind of a joint information center. They run press, uh, press info out of the JICs. Both uh, Santa Barbara and Ventura did the same. And when they're wanting, wanting to release information so you don't have such a crowded chaos type mess going on during your max and during your EOCs, they have a separate room and that information is passed off and different people are assigned uh, to that role specifically and that works uh, well and worked well with everybody. Yeah. And that was some of the problems we had, I will tell you, with the Butte fire is we had too many people in our EOC. Yeah. Uh, we had too many people trying to point fingers and uh, make suggestions that were, you know, seen as semi-orders. So. Um, the different rooms, uh, that's why the sheriff spent time talking about and pointing out photos of those rooms because it's important to keep uh, a clean house during, a, during an emergency. Um, the ACPs or the ICPs, the incident command posts, if you could reflect back to the Shasta County uh, photos that the sheriff showed you with the, uh, the motorhome. Uh, Shasta has a little bit of a different model, but basically they, they move their, their uh, uh, their EOC kind of out into the field. It's definitely shrunk down. Uh, that piece of equipment is incredibly expensive. Um, there's a lot of equipment in there. Some of it was donated. Some of it was found because they happened to find the right guy to build it out and help them. Uh, but their model was a little bit different. Uh, Ventura utilizes the same model, but they, they use that mobile uh, Chevy Tahoe vehicle to place a, an incident commander out close to the scene. We do do the same thing. We have some of that equipment, but not near to the extent some of those other agencies are. And again, when you're talking about communication, um, you know, when uh, in this county we've spoke a lot about towers and our inability to communicate or in, in rural and remote areas and the need for more uh, repeating sites. Um, so they've kind of tried to work around that by building these expensive vehicles that have 
uh, additional communications uh, uh, capabilities. Uh, the cities, uh, the respective cities in, in uh, Ventura County also have their own small EOCs. They work closely with the county. If it's an isolated incident, the county can move in and assist them. And then you have the uh, uh, additional uh, opera operational centers within uh, the fire department. Uh, that Ventura County being a larger county, they actually have a GSA. Uh, this county doesn't have one, but they also, also work closely with them should they have something uh, infrastructure-wise uh, where uh, the general services area uh, would either support or need to take the lead and then the regular county offices. Um, they also have a couple spe special districts and uh, non-governmental offices down on the bottom right. They have a military base, but they work with Red Cross, as do we. And uh, I'm not, I can't recall what N NBVC stands for. Next slide. So uh, back to com uh, communication. I don't want you to jump ahead, but uh, the event that occurs, uh, there's the initial response from public safety. Uh, public safety notifies the county OES duty officer, I want to emphasize county, and that county uh, OES duty officer, and actually let me just step back, <coughs> excuse me. You saw our chart of staff. Now, our OES does not have people uh, full time working in the OES. They go off shift during different hours. Um, so uh, most of the larger places, and the state does a very good job with this, they have a full-time duty officer. So anytime there's a hazard, there's somebody there, they're in place, they can start activating and doing notifications and working on preparedness. Obviously we do not, uh, because we do not have the staff, but the initial uh, response goes to the OES duty officer, which would either be Sergeant Whitney or uh, Lieutenant Hubbardy or a designee. They would do an assessment, uh, begin notifications. When you see VC alert, that's just Ventura County alert. We'll talk about that. That's a pamphlet. Uh, they have a whole pamphlet basically on how they alert the public with uh, which, what's going on with, uh, with uh, an emergency event. Uh, they do an operational area coordination call, meaning they contact any other entities within their area that they would need uh, to uh, respond or uh, address uh, the emergency. And then if uh, needed further, they'll do larger calls into uh, the state uh, where they would ask for additional resources. They would establish their, their section chiefs uh, within their OES, or excuse me, within their EOC. Uh, uh, they would conduct briefings and uh, basically execute duties and manage the event out of there. Um, the far right, uh, it just talks about uh, the duties of uh, the operational area, emergency operations center, all those things we currently do. Um, and uh, the few things that we, uh, we don't do well, we've already made some improvements on, specifically with notifications and communication. The Sheriff's Office started a Twitter account about a month ago. Uh, we have two separate ones, one, one for the Sheriff's Office. We had been relying upon Nixle and local uh, internet uh, media for notifications. We have uh, a Twitter account for the Sheriff's Office, which is more crime issues, and we also have a Cali o OES Twitter account that will start uh, pushing information out uh, on, uh, on that. We have utilized Facebook as well. The Sheriff's Office has a Facebook account, uh, but we found with Nixle and Twitter, those tend to be a little, uh, a little quicker. Um, and I know that you know, with, uh, with an aging population that we have in this county, some of them are, some of them are reluctant to use social media, but uh, it does allow somebody um, you know, easy access to information uh, that we, we can push out quickly and in short notes, meaning Twitter. And uh, I can tell you, if, uh, I'm not a big social media person, but I, I was able to operate Twitter and uh, if I can do it, anybody can do it. It's, it's pretty, pretty easy. Next slide. So we're going to talk about OES staffing options. I'm going to bring up uh, Lieutenant Hubbardy uh, and the sheriff to talk about, uh, talk about these. Um, obviously, please pay attention. And those OES costs uh, do not involve the sheriff's costs. Those are not included in there. But what I'd, what I'd ask you to pay attention to is the bottom uh, the bottom items as far as what, what work's going to be done because those are the questions that we were tasked with by the chair of the board as far as questions relating to animals and communication and public information because I know that was also something that the board uh, wanted to talk about. Looking at option number one of, of two, this is um, staffing uh, to a more robust uh, level uh, similar to what we had prior to the economic downturn um, six, seven years ago. <clears throat> um, the one thing that uh, we found that was very important is the recognition of a, a civilian OES manager. 
that really actually takes the place of the sergeant um, who we're using and abusing pretty good um, stretched between all the other duties he has as well um, that would free up the sergeant to uh, take care of the dispatch duties and the radio communications vehicle fleet and other uh, assigned duties uh, this uh, civilian OES manager would be a full-time position that um, would be in the OC doing the planning the training everything that we've been unable to do for many years based upon the uh, reduction of our staffing the program assistant um, uh, positions uh, is, is a clerical position they're the ones that they're going to support um, the operation as you see in the uh, uh, bubbles below um, uh, public information officer duties which is important because the board has made it very clear that they want uh, uh, more communication and having someone dedicated to uh, public information uh, working with the county PIO uh, is is critical uh, whether it's in the middle of an emergency or just day-to-day -day basis talking about um, tabletop exercises community outreach um, the ability to go out to, to uh, more public meetings uh, having those staff available to do that uh, the alert and warning then the project management uh, along with, uh, with um, animal services liaison and the education and training uh, and then um, and important most importantly or equally importantly is the grants planning and finance uh, which uh, with more staff dedicated um, to that purpose um, the ability to go out and seek grants for funding that would not be general fund uh, uh, reliant is a big plus for us because currently we're only using utilizing two grants uh, right now and uh, that's for equipment it is not paying for salaries could you tell me how much uh, the budget is for the current OES structure? Sure, you have that information. I did not bring that with me. Yeah. Yeah, Lieutenant while they're looking that up, just to confirm, uh, here on your program, assistant, the PIO, that is not a sworn position. That's not the departmental PIO, is it? Mm. Okay. No, it's not. Um, the only the sworn positions is the captain and the lieutenant. Okay. Everything from down below would be like the Ventura uh, model, where it's civilian ran. Um, not you're not paying safety. It's not peace officers. Okay. Captain, I've got it, sir. You can go back to the slide too. The current general fund contribution for OES is one hundred seventy nine thousand eight hundred and forty five dollars. Last year it was eighty seven thousand seven hundred and ten dollars. What was it again? 179? 179, 845. And that was just the general fund? And Correct. The, is that what we're using uh, in all these uh, options, is the general fund or the overall? That'll fund? be up to the board and uh, for us to discuss, but yeah, yeah, we don't. But I mean, how am I, what I'm trying to do is compare the two, the cost, you know, like what are we, Correct. What Correct. Are we spending now? So the 179 is, is the overall cost? Correct. And it's okay. paying for parts of employees. It's not paying for entire employees. That's part of, okay. but there are two grants that are supplementing OES as well, the MPG and the Homeland Security Grant. Okay. Are, are those reflected in those 180,000? What's that? I'm sorry. Is any part of the 180,000 financed by those grants? No. Okay. And those are not paying for any equipment, just okay. to be clear. The general fund contribution is not paying for any equipment. Next slide. Option two, a reduction of, uh, of uh, uh, another option uh, is uh, taking out the uh, lieutenant position, um, still having the sworn captain. Um, supervising and overseeing from an administrative perspective um, still as your civilian OES manager which we uh, find uh, to be the most critical position uh, in this situation and also still running with the same program analysts to get those um, uh, various tasks done at a little bit of uh, reduced cost Uh, the, the program uh, assistants are are there to do everything, get the training going, and have the um, ongoing uh, public awareness. Uh, again, the PIO, the uh, early warning systems. It, it needs to be something that's consistent. Um, we've been lacking in that for years. We were lacking with that even prior to the Butte fire, back when uh, Clay Hawkins was there. Um, back in 2002, 2003, and 2004. Um, 
this is from what we saw in the models in Ventura and Santa Barbara County. These people are full-time employees that are consistently getting prepared and doing trainings with department heads, other departments, and the county, Red Cross, uh, the whole gamut. It, it, this needs to be done so that when we do have that disaster, we're prepared. Um, Bill put it, and you guys agreed, that when you have a plan, if you don't practice the plan, it doesn't do you any good. So that, that's part of this full time. Uh, one thing I wanted to add also, it, it, it just brushed over when, when you're saying ad, um, animal liaison. Um, one of the duties that um, these animals will be doing is establishing um, the, for an example, for animal services, having pre-designated ranches for when we are going to have to evacuate animals. Um, it, it's in, uh, that, having that in place and going out and talking to the Cattlemen's Association and other property owners that may not have stock, but they have the, the property and the fences to be able to relocate um, animals that we have to uh, evacuate out of a disaster area. That would be one of the uh, jobs that um, a program analyst would do. There are so many meetings that uh, take place locally and at the state level that, um, that OES personnel um, need to go to. And we make some of them, but we can't make all of them just because we just don't have the numbers. Um, we do uh, attend uh, the, the fire chief's meetings monthly, water uh, districts um, for the dams, um, going up to Sacramento and uh, um, do, uh, with OES regional meetings. Um, there are so many other meetings that these, uh, these analysts can take the place so a sergeant or a lieutenant or a captain doesn't um, take time out of the day to go to these um, uh, meetings that, um, that, could, that these uh, analysts can uh, attend and report back to what the substance is. Sometimes the meetings are productive, some are just information saying nothing's changed since last month. But you don't know until you're at the meeting. Right. So it's important to, to make those meetings. And again, um, having these program assistants, um, are, they're basically our field workers. They're the ones that are gonna be in the, in the building, but they're out in the field also um, taking care of of a lot of the public outreach and meeting with the with um, the citizens and the various civic groups. Can I add one other comment to that slide? Uh, those program assistants as well would be taking a role during an EOC activation where they would be specifically trained to fulfill one of the requirements right. in the ICS uh, structure within a, within the EOC. Go ahead and switch to the next slide, please. So these are the recommended qualifications for a civilian OES manager. Um, we discussed the salary range of seventy-five to eighty-five thousand uh, with a bachelor's plus experience and/or a person that's a certified emergency manager. Um, we're looking for three years of responsible and administrative experience in the area of public safety, emergency services, and/or preparedness, uh, with included a minimum of one year of supervision. The experience must also include report writing, public speaking, program management, and emergency operations center. This civilian OES manager will support countywide emergency management programs, include managing uh, various grant programs, disaster assistance programs, development of emergent, emergency management plans, training and exercising. The manager would also be responsible for developing and maintaining a, effective uh, working relationships at all levels, which includes with all the other departments within the county. Serves as a liaison between the OES and various government agencies uh, during preparedness, response, recovery management, and hazard mitigation. And of course, the person must be willing to work evenings, weekends, uh, be available in the event of a, a disaster and will be required to serve on a rotational basis 24-7 as a duty officer, uh, the OES duty officer, and must be able to work effectively in a high-stress environment and extended hours during emergencies. Okay, and these were other costs that we uh, came up with that would be associated to running an OES program. Uh, the two OES operations vehicles, 
similar to what you saw from Ventura County. Um, were. And then a third vehicle, which would be the administrative vehicle that would be used for uh, each of the assistants uh, if they were going to a meeting out of county or in county and they needed transportation. Computers would be uh, asked for six tough books. Uh, you saw the Ventura County and the Santa Barbara County EOCs. Every one of their workstations has a computer. Um, six would be the five uh, branch, or sorry, the five groups inside the EOC, and then a sixth one for uh, our dispatch if we needed to bring them in to communicate directly the information uh, from the EOC onto the computer system for our dispatchers. Office supplies, of course, uh, emergency clothing would be for um, all first responders within the department. The field, field equipment, cones, flares, shovels, flashlights, batteries, and then cell phones for uh, each of the positions that were listed up there. And of course, that's an estimate, and it's rounded at 228300 So uh, I just want to get back. Um, so what is our current overall budget for the OES? I got the general fund contribution, but never got the full. I don't actually recall. I know we have, in addition to the general fund, we have two the two grants. Um, they're both right around 124,000 each. Each, I think so. And you get is a, that about right? Sure. Yeah. Um, well, homeland, we only get a portion. Yes. Of the so EMPG so is about 100,000 in grants. EMPG is about 124. Okay. Homeland Security is also about 124, about 124 but we only get about 37,000 of that because that's distributed to the gang of five, uh, public health, Angels okay. PD, fire right. departments, and us. So you say, and we administer what's that. the rounded figure then would you, would you use for it? 160. Do you guys recall? I mean, overall, the entire budget. Sorry, what's that? What's the, what's the entire budget? For oh yes. So it was. It's in here on our computer somewhere. The assessor's office. I mean the. Uh, it's three hundred and eighty-nine or excuse me, three hundred eighty-three thousand nine sixty-two as of today. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Next slide. Any questions? A question, Sergeant. Just a clarification. The vehicles listed here, are those similar to the vehicles we now have for our lieutenants with the uh, extended communication systems? Uh, it would be similar to the vehicle that Lieutenant Hewitt currently drives. Okay. But we were, we were actually talking about expeditions is what is quoted there. He drives an explorer. The expedition so just because you need more to additional. our fleet specifically for OES. Yes. Okay. And then just to clarify, uh, the total OES costs uh, in option one and option two uh, include both grant funding and general fund. No, or is that just that's fund? just the what would be the general fund for the and that's the total not, ad not additional. So you'll, you'll see there's a low and a high range. You'll see there's a low and a high range in that red box that does not include the sheriff's cost, because, uh, but that does include uh, the captain, the lieutenant, the civilian manager within that range, and the program assistants. We're trying to drive those program assistant jobs uh, down a little bit. Mm -hmm. Uh, because we have some other staff in the sheriff's office, which this was a complicating factor that aren't making very much money. So we had to carefully decide how much to pay certain folks. Gotcha. And these this also, are full -time this also positions? Yes. Yes. They are full time, not shared duty responsibility of the existing sheriff's department. All, all That's, this was what was built outside of existing to do it right. 
And again, remember that those total OES costs do not include the um, front line for the, for the equipment. There's going to be equipment costs, the, the, the vehicles, the computers. Sherry, would you move to the next um, the office equipment? Slide. Those will be some one-time costs to get this program back up and running here. And those are the costs listed at the, the final slide? Yes. So we don't have any of that equipment now that we're using? No, ma'am. What do you Can use? You go back to that. Right now, um, Lieutenant Hubbard has a, I don't know what your uh, car is, uh, but it doesn't have any equipment other than our typical radio and red lights and siren. It doesn't have it. We don't have anything that has this equipment right now. So the OES monies we've gotten in the past haven't bought cones or flares or shovels and Nomex overalls or any of those kinds of things? It, they, they had bought some suits in the past that had long since expired. Um, there is some equipment uh, that we have up at the airport, but none of the items that are here. Um, and they're related more to hazardous materials and uh, older equipment. Uh, so no, this is all, uh, this is all new, new stuff. Did you guys, uh, when you talk to these different agencies and, and other experience you've had in the past, uh, get an idea of how much grant funding was out there? Uh, because I, I do like the idea of having, you know, somebody who's, uh, you know, if they're really good at, at going after grants, you know, you can, you, you know, usually you're successful if that's what you're doing all day. If you're good at it, you know, you're going to bring in some uh, money. I'm wondering what kind of success other agencies have had. Some of them get a base allocation from Homeland Security and EMPG that's significantly larger than ours mm -hmm. already, and that's important. But can I, can I tell you about grants real quick? When o OES originally came over, post 9-11, there were a ton of grants out there. And those grants, the restrictions on those and the accountability on those was way different than it is today. Right. And the availability of grants was, was significantly different. The grants now are much more restrictive. A lot of them uh, force you to outlay costs up front only to get reimbursed so my suggestion to the board would be not don't rely upon grants that's part of the problem with the sheriff's office overall and specifically this division we became too reliant upon grants and when the grants went away and the economy shrunk it killed us so I, I would I would encourage the board to not be so reliant if there's a good grant and we see it we'll go after it we'll utilize our business manager and these folks well especially like you know you can uh, you know like the, these equipment uh, costs that you're running out here or additional equipment, you know, that's what grants, you know, are really good for too, is, you know, one-time equipment costs and that type of thing where you don't, you know, you're not relying on the continuing uh, grants coming in to pay for staffing, for instance. That's a really tough one. When you have grants paying for staffing, it's, you know, that that's hard, I know. But, uh, you know, definitely with the grants, you can cover a lot of the other expenses uh, besides the ongoing uh, staffing costs. Captain, question. Uh, with these programs, do you have a timeline for acquisition, phasing in equipment, purchasing? Uh, it's going to be done over a period of years or months or immediate expenditure. What, 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 what's your plan? So if the funding was put in place, we would obviously have to start working with human resources immediately to, to create the two job descriptions. Can you bump back, Sherry? To either program option. We would have to create the civilian OES manager position within the county system and the program assistant. I'm sure human resources would have uh, a lot of input and some uh, advice and ideas on that. We've already spoken to them preliminarily just to let them know we were going to pre be presenting it before the public and the board today two new positions that weren't on there. It was, um, it was advance notice that we may need some help but it was also a matter of courtesy uh, and so uh, we would have to recruit uh, obviously uh, those positions. I, I can tell you that civilian OES manager, Lake County did a recruitment for that position. They paid roughly $85,000 and they were able to grab somebody uh, from within the state of California that had the qualifications. They had some success. I would want HR to tell us what they thought about that price range as far as the ability to recruit and do some research so that, you know, they weren't relying entire, entirely upon what we found out. Um, but, uh, you know, to give you uh, an estimate, it would be easier to hire these folks, uh, I think, than it would be for us to hire our sworn staff. So I'm going to guess, you know, probably six, eight, ten months to get this up off the ground from the time we're funded. And you're talking about, uh, if I added up my numbers correctly, 
about an additional five hundred and thirty thousand dollars from the general fund uh, to fund uh, I think option one or option two. So are you? And I, can I ask how you came up with that number? Are you subtracting the current general fund contribution from what we're saying the total OES costs are? Yeah. Okay. And are you talking about just staff or staff and equipment? I'm talking about uh, if you look at the option two. Um, so that's an additional. Uh, so I subtracted out the 179, roughly, roughly $300,000 um, is the figure I used there for that. And then I added the equipment costs into it. Okay. The problem with that, Supervisor Wright, I, I think you're assuming that existing staff is going to go into that model. What we're proposing is new staff, not existing staff. Right. Well, I, I was only using the numbers that I was given. So if you have an overall cost, uh, that would be great. Okay. So depending on the salary range and the numbers of staff, we would come back to the board with a final budget for this, uh, for this, this program. But I want to make sure you understand, this is, we're talking about existing new staff, so you, you're not going to want to subtract the current general fund contribution towards this. Right, right. I understand what you're saying, but um, I, I'm just trying to, what I'm trying to do is, is uh, for the next board coming in, I'm actually trying to find this out. Not for myself. Sure. Um, but uh, <laughs> but I'm uh, just trying to understand how, how much the ask would be overall for this program. Sure. Uh, for the general fund. Your, your safest bet would be to select an option and decide upon that, that larger amount, so the 485000 uh, Can you move to the equipment? Yes. And then adding whatever pieces of equipment the board chooses to uh, supply us with to that 485000 Gotcha. So just go with that. It's, I, see, I see what you're saying. Just don't just factor in this amount here. Forget about the existing. I would. Uh, I think that would be a safe bet. Now, if we can find efficiencies within there, sure. we would absolutely do that. Um, but I would not try and uh, shortchange this. We've done that in the past, and it's created some problems when we've taken on other departments. Okay. So 475 plus the 228. So. Okay. So in this evaluation, that. it looked like you looked at both the administrative model. I'll call it through it the administrator's office and the sheriff's office. So why, why the sheriff's office? What we found um, in talking to folks, uh, when it's under the CAO's office, it tend, tended to have some more political problems uh, than when it was under the sheriff's office. Uh, you tended uh, to have people inserting uh, political opinions into emergency decisions, which are, is a kind of a bad combination and a bad uh, recipe. Um, you did hear from a couple members of the public today uh, that talked about, you know, the sheriff being accountable uh, to folks. You also, generally speaking, uh, county administrative offices tend to not be heavily trained up front on emergency management, whereas law enforcement uh, uh, and uh, public safety does. Um, and what, what has happened in the past, and I'm not going to say this was with some of the agencies we've, we've uh, we visited, but if you have an emergency manager from outside of an organization trying to tell folks that are actually involved in the day-to-day -day work of managing the emergency what to do and there's a conflict, you have two different departments arguing and nobody's clearly in charge. Um, and to that extent, uh, and uh, I can recall uh, you know, my time here too, um, during an emergency there's no time to argue. Uh, there's no time to have politics and back and forth. Um, and I think when you, when you have a major emergency event, if you have that under uh, an agency or a department that routinely manages emergencies, I think it's a more seamless, uh, efficient uh, model and you don't end up with uh, politicizing what resources are sent where and how that, uh, how that uh, event is managed. Thank you, Captain. Thank you, Department. Good job, Sheriff. Okay. <clears throat> Any other questions? Any questions from the public or comments? Um, it was a very good presentation. The, the question I have is that um, in 45 days, we're going to have four different supervisors. So it's probably important that we allow them to make any final decisions 
regarding this. Um, as I understand it, this is a, <clears throat> a program that was created by Sheriff's Department. And <clears throat> this is a communication <coughs> to answer questions and to uh, um, and get input from the board. So um, this probably, uh, if there's decisions of approval of one program or the other, then perhaps that part of it should be uh, tabled to the new boards in place. Does that make sense? Thank you. Thank you, Bill Winhold, again. So, so what you've seen this morning is um, some very detailed, accurate, well thought out information uh, put together by the Sheriff's Office regarding the, the current state of affairs. Um, there's been comment about uh, how things used to be and I'm part of what used to be. I can tell you that when emergency services uh, transitioned from the CAA's office to the Sheriff's Office, there was a fleet of emergency vehicles that were at the disposition of emergency management. Um, the team was collaborative, they were communicative, and they coordinated activities with multiple departments. This county had an outstanding reputation across this state and other states on how we managed emergency services for this county. This county was recognized by Cal EPA and FEMA for the development of their hazardous materials programs. And today, you have nothing. If you've read the after action reports from state OES and from FEMA, they've been pretty poignant about the issues that needed to be addressed by this county, by this board, to be better prepared for the next event. So you have the presentations here about maintaining the current management structure within the Sheriff's Office for Emergency Services. I'm encouraged that they're proposing that they dedicate staff to manage emergency services. Um, they've kind of been hamstrung and actually were kind of set up for failure over the last decade that they tried to do emergency management services with peace officers. And from the beginning, a police officer is taught not to function as an emergency manager. Their crime prevention, their criminal investigation, they're focused to act as independent agents to take command and control of an event. They're not focused on developing a team. They're not focused on sharing all the information they have with other parties because part of their background is to keep information back that would give a criminal an advantage or compromise an investigation. They respond to more emergencies than many other folks do. So they have the emergency response background, but they come from a different focus than emergency management. 30 seconds. If you bring folk, folks in now as proposed uh, with them, you're going to get a new a new focus on emergency management and not law enforcement. And I would encourage you to consider that, whether it stays under the sheriff's office or goes with another county department. But you have uh, some interesting decisions to make and a lot of responsibility here to move this county to the next event. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Any other public comments? Um, I, I am. I have to agree with, with what Mr. Wenhold said. I'm. Um, I'm happy to see that there is a dedicated civilian staff in here. Um, mainly, what we saw during this emergency was the response occurred in in a very short period of time, and we will have to deal with the recovery for years. And so, where I have seen a lacking is someone who can coordinate and be a liaison for that recovery piece. Uh, so I would hope that a civilian OES manager could do that. Um, while I agree with Captain Macedo, it would never be the OES staff that would actually be involved in doing the work in departments. Um, there is a mechanism there to be um, a support to those departments, to all of our departments, to make sure that we are all privy to um, what's out there in terms of grants or um, other uh, available services that, that we might not know about. Um, and that's kind of what I've seen has really been missing. And so um, I'm, I'm, I, I like the idea of um, not having the, the sworn staff um, because that tends to be um, 
it's just a different, um, it's, a, it's a different take on, on the process. So um, I, I do think that that tends to be more of a response um, centric response and as opposed to that recovery piece, which is um, where we are definitely, and I think we can all agree, lacking. I just want to reiterate a couple things. <laughs> um, the reason for the captain and lieutenant is because, um, as Mr. Winhold said, sheriff's personnel are designed to respond to emergencies. We're used to that. That's what we do. That's our job. So to have this in any other department, and again, this is why I believe it should stay within the sheriff's department, to have that within another department, they don't respond to emergencies on a daily basis as we do. That's our job. To have those personnel, the captain and that lieutenant in place, and if you so choose to do just the captain, we'll deal with that. But to have those personnel in place to direct the uh, OES manager and these other assistants, it gives us that foothold because we do deal with those types of situations on a daily basis. And that's, that's why I think it believes it needs to stay within the sheriff's office. Mike Miller, sometimes county employee, but formerly in my working career, I worked for three agencies in the Bay Area and the East Bay. And prior to OES, we had the incident command system, which was led by fire departments. We had a civilian manager, and each department was represented in an EOC, logistics, finance, PIO, whatever person got there first was the commander of the incident until relieved by the department that had the highest authority. So if a flood came and the sheriff or the police chief was there first or their representative, they were in charge of the incident until they were relieved by the next trained person in the area of the emergency. I'll give you examples. 1981-82 floods. Public Works was in the lead. 1989, Bay Area earthquake, Palo Alto, California. Public Works was the lead. The police and the fire worked on higher level stuff, but when it made the call on where we were gonna close roads and open roads to facilitate emergency traffic, that relied on Public Works. The bottom line is, is it was a, it was a non-sworn position. Every department had to have five levels of training the department heads had to have all the way up to EOC design from entry level. The division managers had to be able to train to step into that department head role down to first line supervisors. Subsequent to the 1989 earthquake in the Oakland foothills, every agency in California was required to do SEMS training. There was supposed to be a change to the standardization of fire nozzle connections and every employee still today is supposed to have a basic level course. Then there's a series of continuing courses which you move up through. And still today, agencies in the Bay Area have civilian incident command systems. They also have sheriff incident command systems. But in the case of first person there and the type of emergency, the command structure can change immediately and quickly. 30 seconds. Just as a couple of follow-on things, in 2001, 9-11, I was working in the city of Livermore, and you'd think, well, how could the city of Livermore be affected by 9-11? We had Lawrence Livermore Lab and our entire police department augmented the Lawrence Livermore lab to protect the facility. It's a nuclear federal facility and a weapons lab. The public works department was given one hour notice two days into it when they were taking every airplane out of the air and telling us every 707 or 737 coming in the Bay Area is gonna land at our municipal airport. So we became the lead department at that time. It's called public services. I'm just trying to say is before you focus on something that's this way, you should also look at the way other agencies, not just county agencies, operate. Thank you. It would be a fair assessment. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. 
any other public comments? Board comments? Okay. I guess I'll just say what I have to say. Then. Um, um, so my two cents is uh, I think that um, it is important that we have a, a civilian OES manager, for sure. Um, I believe that uh, under that OES manager, the flows chart should read the um, during the, the during the emergency. I believe the OES uh, civilian manager should work for admin. And in uh, an emergency, the org chart would look like under the OES manager, um, sheriff, BOS, and admin. Um, not going to cost you anything for the board of supervisors. The sheriff has already its staff and its um, all of its um, plan for emergencies. So they would just do the same thing they always do anyhow. Although would want to take away any any of their funding uh, because they still have to keep up their trainings and and, uh, uh, and equipment needs for an emergency. Um, and then as far as um, the admin side, um, the admin, um, basically the OES becomes the uh, emergency manager at the time um, through the board chair, which is actually would have been really great to have, I got to tell you. Um, and then um, um, the admin, uh, as time goes on, OES director is going to go ahead and, and do the tr those trainings in each of the uh, departments, uh, anyhow, for uh, for the way we operate uh, the emergency. Um, none of that happened. None of it. And so uh, there was there was uh, a, a lot of confusion. Um, I like I said before uh, during the response, the sheriff's office did um, an amazing job. I. I think they, um, I think they did better than anybody could expect. Um, but I also believe that there's a whole bunch more to it than just that. And so the response lasted for maybe a week. Um, after that, it became everything else, and everything else was really big too, very big. And and so that's that's kind of, uh, and, and we're continuing on. Um, so. The OES uh, director should have at least a st uh, staff member in the PIO. Um, and uh, I also believe the OES director should reside in the emergency service center and work closely with the sheriff. Um, uh, because that's, that's where it starts, really. When you have a any type of a disaster, that's exactly where it starts. Um, so, um, I don't know if you guys know about CDART or uh, a couple of those groups out there right now getting training um, to be animal evacuation groups. Um, I think that's, you know, it's just a prime example of how we can coordinate all this stuff, but, but you guys don't have time for it, really. Um, a, a, a civilian OES coordinator would have time to be able to make sure that they cover all bases. Um, you know, one of one of the things that I seen uh, was uh, even the, the sheriff's office get, get they were so busy um, just trying to evacuate people and trying to make sure that um, you know <laughs> bringing it bringing in the uh, what's it 46 different uh, other agencies to help out during that first few days. Um, everybody was overwhelmed. And, uh, but they but they held their composure, and they did very good. Uh, there was a couple of other agencies that could have helped out, and uh, I think with a civilian um, OES manager to relieve them of that, they could have done. Uh, you know, it would have been a lot easier, and we would have had better coverage. And one of the things that, that I can bring up right away is the uh, coordination of the fire districts, and uh, that we have in the county. 
and also the um, um, the water districts. Because one of the things that went out really quick was some water up in Mountain Branch uh, because of a generator, and, um, and and that took out all their hydrants. So. Um, Plus, plus working with PGD, I know PGD came in pretty quickly, but um, but it still took time away from um, the sheriff's department and OES manager. There's no conflict as far as I can see um, on who gives who orders. For me, that doesn't matter. What matters is getting it done and. Um, the sheriff uh, is response. There's nobody going to stand in their way for response. Not the OAS uh, manager, not admin, not anybody. Nobody. Because that's what they know. Uh, but um, as far as like the board, the board could just sit back and not do anything if everything is good. So um, just need communication sometimes. But admin, uh, admin, uh, there, there was a lack of training. And um, so, uh, you know, you get a lot of really smart people trying to in, uh, interject their ideas, and it becomes a, a little bit um, confusing. And then that's how things get missed. So with the proper training, which an OES manager, civilian manager would do, then you have better coordination and it's a more balanced situation. Um, and oh, by the way, it would be way less costly. So, um, since, um, you know, I've, I've actually, right from the get go, this, is, this, is, this was my direction that I would like, to, wanted to do, or, or ask, uh, you know, to be done. Because um, you know, I felt that some of us got put into a position where we didn't, we shouldn't have had to. And um, um, now, now we're here. We're, I mean, luckily we haven't had any uh, disasters. But I got to tell you, it's not going to be long. You know, we have uh, tree mortality, and uh, you know, a fire that happens there is done. We're going to be right back in this situation again, and we're going to be doing exactly the same thing we did before. And I'm not uh, as a civilian. Uh, next week or next month or in January, I don't want to see that happen. Not to my community. So, um, I like the idea of having a civilian uh, OES manager uh, managed by uh, admin, which I didn't think I would ever say, but I'm saying it now. Um, and um, uh, PIO that works with that person PIO could work uh, with PIO Sheriff's Office and um, also a, uh, a um, staff person to be able to support them. And then from there, it, it would be up to the, the training and the individual departments to assign people to that portion. Just like when I worked for um, Pacific Bell, um, way back when, I was, I was a part of the OES for Pacific Bell and uh, statewide, and what we did was, um, in each of our divisions, in each of our departments, we assigned people to uh, take that training, and, and then it just trickles down like that, and then, every, and then you, go through your, um, um, you go through your exercises to make sure that you're uh, ready for the, for the disaster. So, um, Quite possibly, uh, even if we had it that way during this fire, we would have still struggled again, uh, probably, because it was so uh, humongous. But, uh, and I think, you know, considering everything, I think we did great. Um, uh, could we have done better? Yeah, we could have had a lot less stress, that's for sure. But, um, and, and moving forward, um, there are many things that got missed, many opportunities that got missed. And, and I, I just don't, uh, I don't want to put our county into that position again. I want to make sure that we, we get all the benefit. Um, and, and I understand the sheriff's position. Uh, you know, that's, that they, they want to. Um, but I also understand that um, uh, 
that the, uh, the disaster is bigger than just the initial response. And um, why burden the sheriff with, uh, sheriff's uh, folks with that if they're not gonna be involved in it as much? Let, let uh, an OES director, admin, there's, if you go to Siskiyou County, Siskiyou County is, uh, OES is managed under Health and Human Services. And they just had 180,000 acre fire a couple of years ago up there. And they did just fine. So, you know, there's different ways of doing it, but the idea is getting a, getting a, a process in place so that, so, that we can, uh, so that we can act. Now, um, and, and if you want to wait until uh, the next board, fine with me. You know, um, but uh, the responsibility is going to be there uh, now and is going to be there then. And when it happens again, I would think that you'd want the best thing to happen for people of the county and the county. Period. So that's my two cents. All right. Well, thank you for that. Um, so I think that uh, appreciate the work put into this. Uh, and uh, I think either option one or option two are kind of the ideal uh, scenarios. And the problem that I have is just the, the price tag, of course, um, and, you know, dealing with that uh, moving forward as far as the next uh, board goes and the next budget cycle comes up. I mean, where, where are we going to come up with that additional money um, is the problem. So I would look for, I think the key ingredient here is having the civilian OES manager, having that as a full-time position, and at least uh, one, if not two, uh, people uh, down there in the program assistance helping that person. So what I would, I would look to do uh, with funding um, you know, in mind is a kind of tiered approach uh, where you could roll out something uh, you know, over the course of a few years as uh, hopefully the budget improves. Um, and so you could start off by hiring a civilian OES manager and a program assistant, uh, you know, to begin with and then fill in the positions uh, over the course of three years and try to, because I mean, ideally, um, you know, you, hopefully as we move forward as a county, we'll be looking out, um, you know, a little bit more, at least, you know, a couple years in advance when we're doing our budget cycle. Um, I know we can't get too far out because we don't know what's going to happen, but we need to be planning a little bit farther out in advance. And so I think that's, that's what we need to do with this overall program. So I would, I would stick with the overall goal of, of option one here uh, and then realize that that's probably not going to be enough money involved unless we end up getting, you know, millions of dollars from the cannabis tax, in which case you can fully fund option one, no problem. Um, but but I, I would go with planning for option one and just kind of implement it over the course of a couple of years uh, as your funding comes available. But start off with hiring as soon as possible a civilian OES manager. I, I would do that even now with this current board. And I would, I would leave it in the sheriff's uh, um, office. Uh, I think that's fine. Because uh, the good thing about this is you have, with the civilian, you have the OES, you know, that's, that separates a little bit from the sheriff's, uh, you know, structure. Uh, so you, and you have kind of a, ming, a combination of the, of the two approaches. Uh, but I do think that the sheriff's, especially in our rural county like this, the sheriff's department uh, is, is going to be the one that wants to be leading uh, the OES. As long as there's enough support staff, but that's the key, is we have to fund the support staff to do the job. Because I don't think it was that they moved OES to the sheriff's department was the problem. I think it was the problem is that you moved them and then you took all the funding away. And so if you don't have the funding and the staffing, Sheriff's Department, nobody can do anything. So um, that, would be, uh, that would be my recommendation for the next board. Or for us to go ahead and hire the OES uh, manager, you know, even before the next board uh, came into existence. I'd like to recognize the uh, presence of Supervisor-elect Jack Garamendi in the audience. Thank you for coming. Um, I have a question, and I'm, I'm trying to figure this out. Uh, the civilian OES manager position, as it applies to the presentation made by the Sheriff's Department, 
I know it does reference recovery, and this is one of the areas I'm very concerned with regarding the Butte fire. Uh, our, our FEMA requirements, our OES requirements, is that part of that person's duties to assist and administrate that and staying out of the individual departments like we talked about? I, I don't see that reference in this flow chart or is that part of this program? Yes, it's to help each respective entity and or department head uh, go through the recovery process. Um, however it needs to be done so that that is uh, it's not to go into the department and actually do the work uh, not to say this person cannot do work believe me they will facilitate back and forth with FEMA or Cal OES and basically it's to have an expert in place because as you have department heads turn over you're not going to have expertise in the field so you'll have somebody there to walk them through that process that already knows the names of everybody the paperwork that's required and included um, again you know uh, there's going to be probably some training unless we're lucky enough to get an expert, but over time, hopefully that will build, you know, a transition in uh, as you have turnover and, and, and de as department heads or even with fire chiefs and wh whoever throughout the county. Okay, that would be under the control and responsibility of the sheriff's office, the sheriff specifically, as it comes down listed here. Yeah, and I think that's where part of the confusions coming in is what definition of reporting to and what have you. This civilian manager would be an employee of the sheriff's office and that we're recommending and reporting to the sheriff. It's not to say he, you know, his or hers daily, daily duties, uh, especially post-event, I, I would imagine the sheriff would be willing to release that person to go work with people as needed, uh, but they're ultimately going to report back to the sheriff is our recommendation. I realize that's not uh, the entire board's uh, opinion, but that is what we're, we're rec recommending. Depending on the event and how long that takes, that person may be spending a significant amount of time, say, in public health or public works. Uh, but ultimately, they're not reporting, we're not recommending their report to the CAO or that respective department because they may need to be pulled back depending on what's going on. Thank you, Captain. That, that was one of my concerns, just straight, straightening and clarifying that. Um, at this point, I'm undecided. I, I, I think I would like to uh, have the new board take a look at this before we make So, and, and under uh, what I was talking about, the OES uh, director uh, is responsible for, for the, uh, as the director for the, for the emergency. Uh, they don't report. They report to everybody, not just the sheriff. They report to everybody. They report to admin, they report to the sheriff, and they report to the board of supervisors. Who's, in, who's, who's, they, uh, who's in charge? The OES, when the emergency comes, they become the manager of the emergency. Right? So then they just they began working with all of them, not just one. So because it, uh, it involves everybody all at once. Okay. I have a few comments. <clears throat> I believe that this certainly needs more um, evaluation and discussion on many levels. Um, even though last week I was told I was on my way out and probably don't care about stuff, um, I do. <clears throat> so what I see here is that um, more people need to weigh in on this. It's just not something that the sheriff department takes care of. And I was hoping that I would hear a little bit more about um, the sheriff's department talking to lots of different people. Maybe it was done. I'm hearing three different departments and I'm seeing lots of pictures of equipment. Um, but it's really the conceptual idea of what OES is in Calaveras County and what we want it to be. Um, I'm not sure which is the best. I'm not sure if it's the Sheriff's Department, if it's standalone. Um, I need more information. I see a lot of dollars up there. I'd like some financial review of those dollars and see what they truly mean. It's one thing to have the staff and buy some equipment, but it's that day-to-day -day housing and operational costs, too, that I'm not seeing. I'm wondering, you know, in this, I th one of the things that catches me kind of funny is the animal liaison. Um, you know, evacuation and shelter of people uh, would be pretty important to me, and, you know, maybe it's people and animals. 
but I, that, that just kind of catches me funny when I look at that if there is kind of a priority um, or project-oriented thing. Um, we have to look at how we're going to fund this. I mean, we have monies that come in from a couple of grants. We have monies that come in from the general fund. Um, if we say those stay with the sheriff's department, are those grant funds um, still applicable to the sheriff's department? Do they need to be moved over to the OES side? I mean, if you took a low cost of what we see there and the various options to what we have in equipment, you know, it's $800,000, if not a million, when it's all flushed out. Um, I think we need to take a look at how we're going to fund that in the future and, and keep it going forward. Um, you know, I'm, I, again, I have a gut feeling as to where I think it needs to go, but I don't want to say that. I, I think it's important that more study continues. Um, certainly, this was always going to be something that I thought a new board would be looking at in 2017, whether we started three months ago or four months ago, because funding is critical to whatever we do here with OES. Um, so I, I, I'd look for more information and, and more study and more people involved in the process. Um, I think admin needs to be involved in the process. The auditor controller needs to be involved in the project. Um, the process, uh, you know, Bill mentioned some very good things. I mean, we have, you know, we had an excellent history and reputation at one point with OES in the county, and uh, utilizing those resources and the, that information going forward would be very helpful. Um, we have to have equipment. Is it still good? Is it just sitting in an airport hangar rotting? Um, we have new stuff in the sheriff's department. I mean, there's just all sorts of stuff I have questions about, and, and I didn't get them completely answered today. So I think more information, more study time needs to go into this particular thing. It's a lot of money, and a million dollars to get it going and how to, how to keep it going is, is going to be something very important for that grant planning and finance division over there. Well, I just want to uh, emphasize that I do believe that the, regardless of all the options and the overall program, I think we should be looking at hiring a, a civilian OES manager as soon as we can. You know, we really need that position. And I don't care if it's in admin, I don't care if it's in sheriff, I don't care if it's in health and human services, but we need that position to exist uh, full time here um, immediately as far as I'm concerned. So hopefully the new board can tackle that quickly uh, in all the chaos that will ensue uh, in a few weeks. Right. I mean, I, I agree. I think it needs to be a dedicated individual. Um, you know, not sure about the title, the pay, the whatever, but a dedicated individual to it. But well, I agree. Um, actually wanted to do it in April, but here we are in December, or near December. Well, I, I definitely see the need for hiring a uh, OES manager. Uh, I have a tendency to agree with Supervisor Wright right now. Uh, we should have been doing this a while ago, hopefully, and that might be a step in the right direction, maybe even for this board. But the new board needs to weigh in on it. I agree with Supervisor Ponte. We're talking a million bucks by the time we're done here. Um, what it, so the existing structure right now has uh, the OES position is within the sheriff's department, right? Yes. And that's an empty position, or it's a half part-time no, position. They got, they got a couple of people working on it, right? Yeah, that's shared duties. Sure, that's what it is. So, um, so I mean, so that's good. But I mean, what if we just uh, start off by hiring an OES yeah, director? Allocated the there? allocated the funds with this board to hire. Uh, that position full time. I'd like to hear from the sheriff and the captain on that. Yeah. If that's the board's wishes, we can certainly uh, start down that path. I think uh, we need clear direction from the board on who that uh, OES director is, what uh, department that person is going to work under. Um, well, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. That's all right. Um, you know, we have temporary job descriptions in place. We can certainly start working with human resources. I just want to caution the board, and I, uh, Supervisor uh, uh, Wright, 
Uh, I think your idea of incrementally going through things is, is sound judgment fiscally. Um, emergency wise though, I would just be very cautious about sure. yeah. underfunding the issue because you're not going to see the desired improvement that I think we all hope for. Yeah. Um, and again, if it's the board's choosing to, to put this under uh, admin, I think the board and the sheriff are going to need to have further discussion because that's a, con that's a considerable just, issue. We could start now, put it under the sheriff, and then let the new board take it where they want. Uh, you know, that'd be all right with me. We just need a civilian OES manager in place. I hear you loud and clear. You know, as this is an informational item, um, right being uh, brought forward by the uh, sheriff's office uh, it would be something of course that um, would need to be brought back before the board for consideration for actually a position the cost of that position um, a through e steps um, i'm assuming it would probably be a mid-management position so there needs to be some ferreting out along with hr on this issue but once again i just want to remind the board this is an informational item yeah Assistant CAO Moss, would we have a timeline for that to happen? An that's, estimated timeline? Oh, that's clearly that's really clearly up to 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 the board as to when you would want that, that brought back. I would recommend that you would, uh, if you're going to bring this back, that it would would at the soonest it would be in your meeting in December. Uh, and I also wanted to caution, um, I don't want you to think, um, Supervisor Wright, that there's money sitting in the Sheriff's Department that's not currently being allocated uh, to staff. It's already that. being paid. Those, that money is already paying yeah. for staff, so it would be in addition to. Yes. Okay. Um, that's what I was thinking. Okay. It would be an additional. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. And if we decide as a board to uh, go ahead and recruit and fulfill the civilian manager Position would that need a budget adjustment? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yes. Mean, and I know we're up for final approval on budget. budget and, and, right? and I think the thing that's also very important to understand is it's going to take time to recruit for that position as well. Mm -hmm. So I, that's an open recruitment. I guess the question is, is: Are we going to get away without having a civilian OES director? Are we going to not do that? No, well, I think we're pretty much in agreement that we need one. I mean, even a new board that comes in, do you think they're not going to do that? I'm not I don't think I'm going to respond to that, that question. I don't know who's going to be on the new board. <laughs> You're right about that. <laughs> okay. Well, right. Thank you well, for your presentation. Um, yeah, we can do that. Anything else you guys want to add? All right. So let's break for lunch for an hour. So we'll be back at 145. We'll be back at one 45.